YouTube, and members of the public and the media are welcome to watch the meeting remotely and listen to the discussions that take place. So we're now going to introduce ourselves. Um, as I've just said, my name is Anthony, I'm chairman of the committee, and we'll go this way. Hey, hi, I'm Lawrence Weeks from Kenston Aldridge. I'm substitute for David Benson at this point. David Sullins, the head teacher at the Thomas Jones School. Sarah Bowett, um, head teacher at St Thomas's and also St Clement at St Jones Primary Schools. Uh, Ian Hanks, Sarah Education. Right, thanks everyone. Let's uh, pass on to the agenda. So, um, item A1 apologies uh, for absence of have apologies from Councillor Murr, Councillor Schmatterling. Uh, Watson Books, Fairden Court, Amanda Sayers, Kathleen Williams, Jeffrey Brody, and also David Benson. So quite a lot of us um, absent uh, today. Um, A2, declarations of interest. Do any members present have any declarations they'd like to make? Right, fantastic. Okay, item A3, minutes from uh, the meeting on the 23rd of March and the extraordinary meeting that was held to be made on the 30th of March. Um, okay. Yes, Peter. Um, I have three uh, points. Uh, my, my name is not misspelled. I'm the item A4 of the first meeting. I did two T's. Uh, sorry, that's very common. I'm, I'm not on the real part. Um, on A10, um, final paragraph, I think I've come up with a slightly better wording. Um, the forum rejected the following recommendation, recommendation, leaving the submission date unchanged at the last uh, business day in May, last working day of May. And the yeah, just a very minor one on the second, uh, the 30th of March one. Um, there's B missing from the final um, line of these, of the final line of page two. Oh, right. these. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I did my apologies actually on the day. Do so. you want that just amending in the. I would imagine so. Yeah, is it, are, you, are you down as being present? Indeed, I am. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Okay, anything else? Okay. Yeah, uh, so if I declared my interest as a head of the Jungle School, but I also said that they an education head of the I don't know whether that's actually important or not, but um, just in case. Yeah, I mentioned Yeah, okay, that's yeah. Okay, fantastic. Right, thanks, everybody. Um, right, item A4. Let's move on. Uh, DSG out term school balances for 21 22. Um, then I think we will be leading on this. Well, I need to have a man to go for it. Yeah, so um, you see from the paper that the, the DFG, DFG, DFG had a deficit in the year of 2,215,000. That increase, increases the cumulative deficit to. Uh, quite scary, yeah. seven million six hundred and five million, and um, the, the details of, of the overspends on the early years block and the high needs block are, are shown in the paper. And, and as we know, the main reason for that overspend is in relation to the high needs block. The overspends on the top up due to the increase in the, in the numbers of children with education, health and care plans, and also the value <coughs> of the allocation through the banding tool. 
um, and also overspends of the independent placements. This, there is actually a favourable move when compared to the last forecast, it has improved by 660,000. Um, there were reductions relating to out of borough and post 16 forecast costs where we hadn't been advised that the pupils had left some of the placements, so obviously the cost didn't materialise and um, some other uh, minor changes and also uh, Julie said we were really, really strong in making sure that we were not paying anything in, in relation to any, any adult social care element of placement, so we were only picking up the education element. Uh, so, so while it's still a, a large figure, it, it has improved um, quite a lot since the previous forecast. There is a separate paper, I'm sure you know about the deficit management plan, so I probably won't say too much more about the deficit, what we plan to do about that. The other part of the paper has got the individual school balances, and they're all shown in the appendix. And uh, we now only have one school in deficit, that's a reduction from two last year. Uh, so uh, schools, you know, have really managed their budgets well. Um, and, and dealt with any financial pressures, which is good news. Julia, don't know so the answer to this, but reducing the deficit by 74,000 looks substantial. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, whilst there's a deficit, it's, it's gone down substantially. Absolutely, yes. I, you know, we, we, we meet with um, St. Francis at the CC uh, regularly, and yes, they, they've taken, they've been very proactive in taking a lot of action, yes. I think it's going to say that their recovery plan is on, on track as well. We're getting yeah, track on, on track. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Anita. I think two things on that really, I suppose, is one, as difficult as the decision was at the last meeting, the indication that it's the right decision to make in terms of reducing deficit or why it's going to get worse. And you see, we'll see that later. Mm -hmm. And also, I think we, we do need to minute and note that, you know, that there, there have been pressures on numbers, school balances in Europe very, very healthy. Um, and I think if we're in other parts of the country, with a very different application of funding formula, we wouldn't be seeing quite a similar picture. Um, very impressive with the two schools in deficit of many such as uh, Alison's notice is significantly dense into the, those deficits, which is great to see. Are there any other questions or notes on this? Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Um, can we just be assured that the comment on, uh, on schools on table one, which there are further costs relating to 21 22 still to be processed by pension, presumably pension contribution for leaders, presumably they're not material to this? Um, uh, no. Um, I, I mean, uh, you know, under 100 or. Yeah, it was under 100, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, about 80, yes. Um, so we've taken account of that, but we know there's still, there's still to be finalised. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I mean, you're going to have to forgive me if I meander here a bit. Um, I remember, yeah, many years ago, um, lots of discussion here around the sort of theme of um, trying very hard to budget for every single thing so that there wasn't any seemingly any contingency of a lump sum or a carry forward that was there in a very transparent way. And we worked very hard, all, all the schools have had in support in varying degrees to to ensure that you know, what, what you end up with is, is, is a zero budget, so there's nothing in that column. There was a lot of talk at that time about uh, the DFE clawing money back. It, has that completely gone? In terms of if there is some money that's in excess of the recommended, the recommended um, eight percent for primary schools, has that completely gone away, or is there still this sort of shadow that we have to be very cautious of? So there's there's nothing now in the um, regulations or the suggestions on the scheme for financing schools about a clawback. I can't tell you what might happen in the future, but at the present time, there's nothing that gives any indication that, that there should be any clawback. I think that's always long so slide. Because I, I think there are conversations happening at the DfE about clawback or 
there's discussions about those schools that have more than 20% reserves, and that's certainly an active discussion. Um, and certainly some schools, particularly academies, can't apply for certain grants if their funding levels are above 5% or 8% primary or secondary. I think there might still be developments. Yeah, we, we looked into this issue a while ago, I think, and we had a discussion about it, and the, the SFA are um, a bit grey on this, where it used to be quite hard to do. I think that's because there are so many schools with far more than 5%, 8% in reserves. And I think, you know, this, I mean, obviously, what I'm going to say is we can make it sound much simpler than it really is. Um, this is your field, you know, not mine. Um, but it strikes me that, you, that there, are, there are two solutions there. Um, one is you know, you do nothing, you, you just have it there, it's very transparent, isn't it? At least it's transparent, it's amounts of money that's there in reserve. Or you do what lots of schools do, which is that you do allocate that money to capital projects that are planned for the future or non premises projects that are one off, but they're not revenue, that they're things that are going to enhance the quality of children's outcomes or well-being, self-esteem, what have you, but they're not things that are sustainable beyond one year. So, I mean, that, that might be useful uh, by way of sort of some, some sort of partnership work to just email schools, not, not to scare them, but to um, either to bridge come from you or, or for us, a consultative or in a future um, briefing, it's briefing, you know, to communicate that, be careful for next year, you know, in terms of how, what, what you do with those reserves. How they appear in your budget. And we're certainly, you know, looking at these, that has sparked an interest in me, in my own, and I'm sure that would be the same for some other ones. Is, is it more appropriate to do it the other way around? Isn't it more appropriate to say to schools that there is a possibility of a clawback over a certain level? But there hasn't been an announcement that there will be. Yeah. I mean, no, 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 there's discussions about you know, what's appropriate. Hence, we say yeah, possibility. Okay. Uh, yes. So to ensure that if you do have a deficit, you have considered fully. We can't be seen to be using Sitting deficit. On money. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. We've got to do the positive. Absolutely. Yeah. I okay. think that would be quite a good, quite a good message. So can I just be clear about what, what you're saying? Um, are you suggesting that uh, where you have schools with a the character, that there should be some sort of system whereby working in partnership with other schools that could be I think it's a jolly good idea actually in principle in practice it's going to be uh, not as, as simple as it looks because actually I expect it's fit in the right thing for them. I think I think it happens detail. actually. I do think it happens in federations where, where, yeah. where there's a very healthy um, long term relationship. I'm sure it does. Surely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it happens in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Of subsidies or, or financial assistance. I, I think, if, if I may, to just look at it slightly different ways, that the money that is generated and received by schools has a lot of benefit of pupils in school in that year. So mm -hmm. if you are carrying forward funds, there needs to be a rationale for that. And that rationale every year should be documented whether you do that in the statutory council. To be a school, you have a report to the local authority. But it's just a mechanism that you are able to transfer them about what it is that that money is going to be used for. That's that quite easy to get to. I mean, that's certainly that's what we do. Yeah. Um, I, I I think I, I wouldn't do too much at the moment though because I think with the whole education update shifting, I think there's certainly sort of nothing to tell you the um, years of bad change in the last little while. I think they're going to come out with something anyway. Um, so I think maybe. Probably best to just wait and see what they say in due okay. course. And it, with the current number situation, there is no harm in, if schools are able to build up results, reserve, not all of them are, and in, in trying to continue that. It's not, it's not like the numbers situation is currently reversing, is it? Um, but yeah, I would add to that and just say I'm sure that when you look at school three year plans, the, the situation then kind of you start to see that the reserves are reducing quite yeah. significantly. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's just about making sure that the yeah, balances are allocated and that they're not unallocated. You've had that discussion with, with, with your government bodies. I think David's suggestion, where it is perhaps approaching that 
20% figure that Stephen's happily mentioned, you know, if there is a potential one-off capital investment perhaps you might make in, in the site, that, that that's probably worth considering. So you are allocating that, you know, increased suitability in terms of provision for children. Because I, you know, obviously I have to say, you know, post the election, the council is reviewing its capital programme and our capital programme you know, is under pressure. So particularly for community schools where, where we are, the landlord, if there is the opportunity for schools with slightly larger balance, perhaps contribute a bit more to a capital scheme that we all want to happen, then, then you know, that, that might be a sensible way to, way to progress. So, helpful discussion to have. Yeah. One of the suggestions that's been made to me about my deficit is that any child who is long-term in the hospital or psychiatric unit, that the school should pay towards their stay in hospital. I don't think that's ever been formally set up. I don't think it's ever happened. We have now 22 children who come from other schools or have not been in schools who, who, who we don't have that money for. And we certainly don't get the 6,000 that's taken away from us with the HC plan. So we have no 6,000, we can't have it taken away. So Elisa, you've been so helpful with this. Is that true or not? Which, which bit, sorry, Jeanette. But, Every time we have an EHC plan, you take off 6,000, which we've never been given. Yeah, I, I, this, this doesn't feel like a formal matter. This seems like a very specific to you setting, rather than an across the piece. So it seems like something that officers should yeah, pick up yeah. with you rather than discussed here. But it is, a, it is to do with all of us, because in all our schools, children become very ill, end up in hospital. And, uh, you know, there is a bill for them. I agree. But I have been... Is that something to put on the next agenda? Well, I think that's for officers to, to look at. But it, 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 that's, you know, we leave our schools at the door. That's a very specific to one setting. Um, right? We're not, we're we're not going to make a decision about one particular school. We make a decision I just want to raise it. I hope it's yeah. in the minute. Okay, yeah, no, no, yeah, absolutely, well, and, and what the action I think has to be for the officers to go away and discuss well, and look at like the issues around, uh, around the funding. Okay. And I would just add that, I, oh, yeah, I hope you feel that in terms of the work that we're doing together with the new governors, we're, we're trying to work through some, some of these issues, and I suppose that's a, just to reconfirm, that's an offer for any school that is you know, facing budget challenges, and of course, you're, as, as the records show, you're, you're not in deficit yet, you know, which, is, which is a great thing. But we really want to support schools that maybe risk going to debt. So appreciate the point you're making. And well, I think we've got a meeting in the diary, haven't we? So yeah. Yeah. Right. Can, uh, I, right. can okay. I just ask one more thing for clarification? You mentioned somebody mentioned about where you are spending uh, this money. Is it there some transparency around it? Where, 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 do you, where do you see that? So if you're going to, I mean, our school, we, we put up the house, the little house, many years ago with um, some reserves that we had. I think that, and, and, uh, this was a long time ago, but what, what, are, what are the requirements in relation to being transparent about how you're spending that money? Ways to your board of governors office, yeah, because they go on your website. Oh, they go on, yeah. yeah. So, so there's non confidential items <coughs> you, you're discussing. But the question is is there something which we, is there a must here? Must we be? Uh, well, on, on the capital side, now I, I don't think there is specifically, Chris. I mean, obviously, we, we publish details about our agreed corporate capital program and where there's investment in schools. Clearly, if there's a contribution from the school towards the project, perhaps that we're needing, we, we might acknowledge that. Because otherwise, I think, as Andrew said, it would clearly be in your government body minutes. Thank you. Okay. Great, nice. Anything else on this? Okay, it's fantastic. Right. So, um, I asked the committee to note the report. Um, and the recommendations in 5.1, both of them did you carry full position and the level of the school. Um, <laughs> right, so we move on to the updated um, deficit management plan. Um, and this report sets out the updated uh, ESG deficit management plan to be submitted to the and I think Julie is this year and both of you. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm going to start. So, um, Yes, this is the updated um, deficit management plan, um, and um, the, the, the key table, the table two, um, so it, it shows the position that our, our deficit management plan is in, and also the position if we haven't taken the corrective action that we 
that we have with schools and with um, discussions and detailed work with the high needs budget review group. Um, so, you know, there's a, a detailed deficit management plan template. It's got over 20 worksheets, and there is a, a link on the website to that. And we have to show the, the position for the current year and the next four years. So this is taking account of the outturn position in year, or <coughs> cumulative position of 7,605 starting position. It also, um, we've also included as appendices, A, B, and C, some of the key pages from the 40-odd um, pages in the detailed plan. And it does reflect the, the all the agreements that have been made by the schools forum. So we've listed in the paper 2.1a all the papers that have previously come to the forum that are reflected in the recovery plan. It also continues to include the uh, ongoing transfer from the schools block to the mining's block of, of half a percent. And obviously that gets that gets um, that comes to the forum every year. So key figures in summary, if you look at table two, and it's the 26-27 year that uh, we think that our, our calculations are showing that even with the corrective action, we'll have an in-year deficit of 3,259,000, and the estimated cumulative position by that point is 20,177,000. So that they are you know, very significant figures. And then at the bottom of that table is the unmitigated, if we hadn't taken the agreed action, where the in-year would be 6,447,000 and the cumulative would be 33,955,000. Um, I'm going to pass over to Julie, who's going to talk about the, the, the key actions that, that have taken place and are willing to have in place. So, um, I'm going to sort of draw on the information that's in um, section five onwards, but uh, I think the the key message is in terms of the mitigation, what we're trying to do is manage demand and make sure that the money that we use, we use wisely. So we want to support children in the local school. We want to ensure that as many children as possible can be supported through the ordinarily available provision and to make sure that we've got capacity in local specialist provision to meet the needs of anybody who needs that much greater, that step up in terms of the response to their special educational needs. Um, so we, we have done some forecasting of the number of places that we think that we'll need. And um, we predicted that we'd need 160 specialist places by 2025. And part of that 160 was our new special school, um, Kensington Queens Mill. Um, we, we had a look at the number of children, well, sorry, young people aged 20 to 25, and we, in January 2020, we were very much higher than uh, national average. <laughs> and so um, we, we've done some work, as, as Anita said, you know, with our colleagues in adult social care, looking at who can have their needs met through um, adult social care provision. Can we just interject, why does any of that budget come out of the school budget? Is it not all social care? It's, it's a really great question. Sorry, no, I didn't know. It's a history to it, but... When, when the reforms were introduced, so when the Children and Families Act came in in 2014, it extended the age range... Free HCP through front of that. Yeah, absolutely. No additional resource came with it. It simply said, if anyone wants to carry on learning and their EHCP will continue, that is a cost to the high needs block. So they have to be learned. So they, yes, right. but the definition okay. of learning has been tested by the High Court, and it isn't that you're necessarily on an accredited course, it's that you are studying. So, um, so there's, there's, a very loose, there's a very loose definition around that. Um, so if young people say, actually, I want to carry on learning, or their families say, um, we want our, our son or daughter to continue uh, studying, um, and there's some very expensive specialist colleges that are residential. Um, there are some small independent sector providers. And what what our data had shown us is we were funding a lot more 20 to 25 year olds. And it was a very big red flag to us about do we have the right provision? And I think that nationally, when the reforms came in, the market wasn't ready. 
So what we've had to do is think about well, what can we do differently. So we've we've worked um, in partnership with our adult social care here to help them understand the things that we we can't legitimately charge to schools. That's not fair. Um, but we're also working with them on a bridging um, program where we hope to have new provision that will see some of those young people whose ultimate destinations are in adult social care accessing a more appropriate offer for them which is about life skills and their journey to adulthood so um it's one of the things that we really want to keep and you mentioned at paragraph seven as well that you're looking at it's, yeah. it's a real indicator for us in terms of the things that we want to do to mitigate we want to make sure that the offer at 2025 is an offer that links in with where's the ultimate destination for this young person because for most of our young people we're ambitious that it will be employment or supportive employment so that that's why we really focus in on that as a you know what how are we tackling this we want to see the numbers of young people with plans at 2025 reducing the proportion reducing so at para 57 we said you know we want to develop uh, we want to continue to develop lower cost specialist provision in local schools and there's a little bit of a summary in para 58 of the things we've already done so we've got the new special school with capacity to eight for 80 We've increased the number of places for nursery aged children through special provision at Goldbourne and Maxilla. The specialist resources we have at Marlborough and Bowlby are growing, so they'll be taking more children. And we've got plans in place for new primary specialist resource provision, uh, developing post 16 provision, and a secondary um, where we're currently doing the work with that secondary school. Um, it's an academy and we have to work through the regional schools commissioner to create that provision. But really great interest from local schools to host high quality provision that we know that we can do at a more affordable cost than the, the um, alternatives which are in the independent sector. Okay. Right, any questions on this? I think just what, one thing to note, obviously the 20 million plus four years are pretty eye-watering. Yeah, but better than 33 million. Yeah, which, which I mean, I suppose is due to the actions that have been taken by the school. Um, so, Chair, I was going to yeah, speak to follow you. up on that. I mean, presumably, this has to be financed by the um, borough finance department. It is, uh, are they aware of this uh, and yes. uh, are they prepared to finance it? So, they, so it, what happens is it, it, it is shown as a negative. Um, reserve in the, on, on the balance sheet. Right. So, um, well, there might there might potentially be some you know cash issues. Obviously, the council has to pay, but it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be covered by other funds in the council. It is by um, by the the financial regulations. It has to show as a negative reserve, it's right. not subsumed anywhere else. But clearly, there is a risk to the but, council. But but but, but does. Does the um, department have the right of unlimited call on the borough finance? No, it would be you know it clearly is a you know a real concern in, ter in terms of the size size of this and and particularly that so at our previous plan we showed that we were able to bring nearly back into balance in year we couldn't deal with the cumulative mm. deficit so obviously it's a, a much you know it's, the position has significantly deteriorated has shifted no. and that is of, of real concern so we will uh we will be getting more challenge from um from the, the director of finance and no doubt we'll get more challenge from um the esfa as well once we submit this plan um and then and that does come in quite nicely with the, the fact that we're we're not eligible for the safety valve funding like some of our neighboring boroughs because our deficit's not high enough or wasn't high enough, right. but we are. We have been picked to be one of these delivering better value um, local authorities. So uh, the safety valve program does give funds to help eliminate the cumulative deficit. This new delivering better value doesn't. Although we will be trying to bid for funds for things that help us develop provision and and you know things that, that can be done perhaps regionally or so we will we'll try and get what resources we can but it won't be anything that will potentially eliminate the deficit but might help going forward in terms of the in-year yeah. deficit but well, 
in my honesty. Can, 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 can we just clarify? Because we've, we've had the safety valve thing come up at H and F a couple of times. That, that's a reduced cumulative, but isn't it triggered by significant in year? Yes, so they yeah, already so twenty had, million in year. Yeah, they've already got. Like, yeah, right. they. Yes. They're already at 33 million and Hillingdon have and just been given one. Yes. Yes. No. That was the second point I was going to make. Are these, in terms of London boroughs, let's say, are these exceptional figures or is everybody else being faced with the same sort of numbers? So when we're, uh, the vast majority are placed, uh, are faced with, with very, I think there's only, um, so even in Westminster has now moved to a deficit position, which they weren't in before, and were one of I think only two in London that were not in deficit. Um, so it's 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 certainly not exceptional, which is, you know which is not good yeah. in 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 many ways. But we don't we don't stick out in right. terms of the size. Um, but we will you know we have lobbied lobbied before about the fact that we need safety valve funding and. We will continue to do that, even though we've been put in this new program. Um, and you know, it will it will be absolutely key the work that uh, we do with the high needs budget review group and the forum in terms of us all keep challenging yeah. what are things costing, what are we charging there, uh, you know, and, and and so on. I, I was very pleased to see in Appendix A you'd actually um, directly. Um, Basically, what I believe to be the elephant in the room is in the, the Children and Young Families Act of 2014 established a whole raft of very um, sort of, uh, desirable objectives. We did fund them. Mm. And this has been, um, well, my observation all along, but it's good to see that it's in, in print. Um, presumably, there's not, you know, things like the 6,000. Um, in school, um, um, SEN sort of level of support and whatnot are statutory, and we can't sort of reduce them, you know, pro rata to 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 further reduce the budget. I mean, you can't sort of say, right, well, we've got bids of twenty million and cash of eighteen million, therefore we'll fund ninety percent. No, yeah, you're, you're right, it's mandatory. It yeah, but the, yeah. the other paper on today's agenda talks about consultation, so it's an opportunity to lobby for, for some of that stuff. I need to mention the, the safety valve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not eligible for that. We do know that nationally there'll be 80 million available for the living best value scheme. So we will be pitching very hard for a share of that. Um, you know, colleagues in the room will know that if we can get a share of money to really invest in speech and language therapy, that early intervention will, you know, that's an upstream investment that will really help us. So if we can leave us some of that money, then the amount that we're mitigating, um, you know, we could see some of the year pressure reduce as a result of that. And we know that some of the things that are very expensive for us are when we have to commission from the independent sector. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the quicker we can bring on stream <laughs> our own provision, and um, every pound that we spend in um, specialist resource provision that's in one of our own schools is um, a pound that then gives added value because there's a, a member of staff there who can support the training for the whole of that school. There's a member of staff there who's available to um, do some kind of peer coaching with other teachers in other schools in the area. So, you know, we, we really want to maximise what we can do locally and avoid spending it in the independent sector where that's it, the pound's gone, if you don't get the value. Finally from me, uh, we had a uh, change in control in Westminster. Is there any indication whether they're more or less, um, going to be more or less um, um, amenable to sort of joint, joint venture? Um, Schools. I think Ian might want to get in with that. Just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, good question, Peter. Um, I'm just had a local like elections. Um, the services re elected here, big change in Westminster, where yeah. Westminster and Labour. Um, I think definitely the, and, you know, things can always change. And we, we had some changes, some of our Bibra services before the elections. So we had a, a Bibra IT department, I think that was splitting. And that was decided under previous administrations. 
definitely the initial um, feedback we've had from politicians in both programs is for actually our outcomes within fibre and children's services. And obviously, we hope Ofsted reinforces that because they're expecting us at the moment to stay in tomorrow, but also within fibre adults, you know, outcomes of adults are, are, are really strong. And that, therefore, you know, the fibre departments seem to be working well. So there are no plans on the part of our administration to make any changes. Of course, things can change and reviews happen. All these things happen. We're not hearing any immediate sign from either borough that a change is needed to our fibre operations. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, Chris, did you have a question? Yes, just in relation to the way that the best in the future, which that is a long does that take to actually? So it, it can be really quick because if you can put um, additional intervention around children's speech and language development in key stage one, by key stage two, you're not putting in place a, an education health care plan because you've been able to do it early. If you weren't able to do that, by key stage three, you could be looking at something that was require really expensive specialists and perhaps even residential so you know you you really can see the savings quite quickly we, we're doing a little bit of pilot work in a, a speech and language unit in, in westminster um where we're outreaching to other local schools from from the provision and what we're doing there is in skilling the class teachers in the other schools and so you can imagine the ripple effect from that is every child in their class who's um, it needs a, a bit of support with their vocabulary and their language across the curriculum, it's now going to get it from their class teacher. So the modelling that you've done actually shows... Yeah, and in fact, we're in contact with another local authority who were able to kind of put some pound signs next to um, an initiative that they've been doing. So, um, you know, we're pretty convinced that, that if we can get the money for the, the pump priming, which is why you'll see we've used that phrase, in the, you know, our suggested response to the green paper, you know, there are things we could do, but we need some money up front to be able to get them off the ground. Thank you. Thank you. I've just got a quick question, 5.3. So we're talking about the um, uh, commissioning, incrementally commissioning the place within the Kensington and Queensland. Are there any threats or risks there to what's happening in the Queensland and the and their financial situation? Because they're separate schools, separate DFE numbers, separate off their inspections, um, we're, we're not seeing that there, there's any risk to that. The um, We've set up Kensington Queens Mill with a fixed top-up rate, so we know exactly what it costs per place, and they know what their their running costs are. So um, we, you know, we're in close contact with them, obviously because we're in a co-sponsored school, so no, we're not... Um, seeing the kind of doom and gloom that perhaps has been reported in the press. Sorry, I'm yes. certain of what you mean. Can you explain? Uh, so the, 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 it's part of yeah, the Federation? The, the the Queen Charlotte's Trust, 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 Trust. Yeah. runs Hammersmith and Fulham Queens Mill, but also is a co-sponsor of our special school. Okay. In the Queens Mill in Hammersmith and Fulham, the top-up funding that they receive, the school receives from Hammersmith and Fulham is a concern for them. And I'm I suppose, yeah, I suppose my question is around the leadership of the finances uh, and that was their trust in them. Not that they're yes. it's, a, it's a reputational damage here that might put some parents off it's agreeing with you that that would be the best school for their child. Because our school has a separate DfE number and a separate Ofsted inspection. I mean, we've got 80 places and 80 places will be filled so that you're in not September. Concerned about the no. Bill, not concerned about the impacts on provision. Not, not at this point, I think. Sorry. I mean, it just does that. I mean, what's in the public domain is unfortunately Hammersmith Queen's Mill Special School has, has got an inadequate Ofsted rating. Um, but clearly, obviously, we continue to work with Hammersmith and Fulham. And also, we have a number of Kenton, Chelsea, and Westminster children actually at Queen's one of their associated uh, units and I, and I know Julie you've been working with Freddie the executive head to to re reassure parents uh, about the work they have to improve provision they obviously for our own residents but but I know also we are our safeguarding teams both in Byborough and in Hammersmith and Fulham you know absolutely full cooperation with both schools have offered to do a, a safeguarding audit to demonstrate to parents that actually some of the concerns that were flagged in the uh, Ofsted report the Queen's are, are being addressed 
and we also thought it was useful to to do that to that similar joint order in Kensington Queensville, precisely to reassure parents mm -hmm. about the provision and the steps we take to improve it. So I, 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 I may make it wrong, but I assume that Kensington Queensville has not actually had one yet. Only it's pre-opening one. Yeah. 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 So, but so obviously, there's a risk that that, that Ofsted will now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but as Ian says, the the issues that were raised in um, Hampton and Fulham. We've done a review in our own school. Yeah, it's about that reputation. I was just thinking, yeah. you know, how parents know that and how to they therefore have confidence and use that service so rather than feeling to go to yeah. private. Should we interfere? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, there, there is always a risk that if you know if the school goes into a category, then parents will say, I, you know, broke their feet, I don't want that school. Mm -hmm. It's just by saying that Dr. Piper and Hampton School are working closely with the DFE, who is the responsible body for the academy in Hampton School and the fruits to the Hickman case. So. Okay, all right, two groups. David, quick one to make it real quick. So 5.2, uh, that's quite, it's quite interesting, 5.2. Um, there's a couple of things I think are missing there, Julie. I think one is reference to context. Context is everything. Um, parameters of the school's building, limitations there, class sizes, in terms of how, how small the classroom is, um, costs, incurred by certain kinds of children with an ample family, the sheer volume of children, um, percentage significantly above the average. I mean, you, know, you know as well as I do that there are schools that don't have many um, children with the CM and there are others, and I mean one of them have a lot. Um, with very, very, very small classrooms. Some children have mobility issues and challenges. Um, and I think context needs to be in here for some, but I think also it needs reference to a challenge for some of the schools, <coughs> those schools that are popular, where they are, we are overwhelmed with requests literally every week, sometimes more than one, and it's all year. And that's overwhelming. It takes up so much time for the, the of course, simple like the school, empty funny, one sinker. Um, having to respond to all of those. So I think that's something that, that could really be useful. And the, the, the question I have is, is 5.8, where it refers to uh, plans for new primary provision. What is that? So there is a primary school that I am working with to develop a new specialist resource provision. So it will be a provision that will cater for um, up to 16 children with autism when it's full, but it'll open incrementally. So at the moment, we're just um, going through the um, organising temporary accommodation to start very small scale this autumn. And um, just we've just recruited a teacher for it, but we haven't done the comms yet to the wider school the parents of children already at the school so that's why i'm not naming it at this at this point yeah thank you david i just respond to the point about the context oh, in five yeah, two yeah, thank you, yeah david i completely understand what you're saying that the, the benchmark data is there to help us ask questions not to give us the answers and what we wanted to do is be able to send heads information because people often say to me well how many have other schools got have i got you know we got the most here um, and the reason that we only share it with head teachers and we're not kind of putting it out of general pop population as, as a bit of information is because people do need to understand the context that they're reading that benchmark data in so i agree okay thank you right um so recommendations Schools Forum is asked to agree uh, 811 just to agree the draft deficit management plan as our language. 812 um, agree that the deficit is not cleared by the other council figures, but it's been seven due to the size of actual cumulative deficit. Um, and 813 note that Kensington and Chelsea on the LA that take part in the DFE and DBB programme. All agreed. Okay. Agree. Can, okay. I, can I go back just that's one question? Yeah. Maybe. Sorry. No, you were saying that one school that we obviously can't name. How was that school chosen? That um I'd asked schools to express interest 
Well, yeah, it's gone out to everybody. Yeah, but our school to express interest, and there have been a, a number of schools have made in, uh, expressed interest over a period of time, and, and I've been kind of jogging back and following those conversations up with them. And, and some people expressed the interest when we then had a conversation about what it entailed, it decided it wasn't right for them. Could I just really briefly, I don't want to move on, where that involves SEM capital spend, we have an SEM capital board that, that I chair, we review, you know, expression of interest from schools, and also we consult in a really transparent way with our care and care board, so we call it like here in KNC to say, here are the benefits to having this provision, these types of places with this school, so, so we seek to do it in that transparent way, obviously once you know, the comps has gone out in the right order. Okay, great. Thank you. Right. Um, paper A6, uh, Dear Mr. Sims Review. Um, Thank you. So I've mentioned a couple of times this evening well, we've got this opportunity to um, share our thoughts on uh, what, what the DfE is proposing in terms of its reforms. I've given you the um, kind of challenges that they have set out, which is, um, you know, the system currently isn't delivering best value for money outcomes are poor and navigating the experience is negative for families. We don't recognise the first two bullets in Kensington and Chelsea because we know our outcomes for our children with SEN are good and um, our families told Ofsted in our SEND inspection that actually you know, generally they were happy with the way the system was working but we do very much recognise um, that the, there's not enough money in the system. So at Para, I um, particularly just like the unprecedented um, investment, <laughs> which definitely wasn't the us. And <laughs> uh, um, that, that's in the, all of the press absolutely, releases from them. Absolutely. So they are proposing a single SEN and AP system. So it's very interesting that AP is now being brought under the umbrella, and the DfE is rational for that. Rationale for that is that eighty-three percent of uh, young people in AP have SEN. So that's why they decided it needs to be there. So um, from section five onwards, we've suggested some of the things that we might want to have in our response to the consultation um, from a finance perspective. Obviously, this is we literally only looked at it from a finance lens in this paper. We'll be wanting to make a very detailed response to the whole consultation. Um, so the questions are um, appended so that you've got all of the question. We want to encourage everybody to make um, a response in their own right. I hope you know, governing bodies will make a response in their own right. But these were just some suggestions of things that we might want to say. You know, we, we need some pump, 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 pump priming. Um, you know, workforce development needs to be ongoing. There's a cost to making sure that you've got the workforce that can deliver your ordinary available provision. Um, you know, there are London costs that we would want the DfE to take into account. Um, we think that the adult social care should be paying for everybody's own teeth. <laughs> so they're, they're our suggestions. And obviously, you know, we picked up uh, Peter's point about the, the 6,000 mm. and um, the 10,000 that applies to, to special schools. Mm. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Um, 518. Um, proposals do not cover the base funding of special schools, which would be 10,000. Is that 10,000 per place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Given uh, a, I'm sorry, Peter. Yeah. Um, the other point I was uh, going to uh, suggest we might include, which is I can't see on here a particular bugbear of mine, is there's no point in giving people, um, uh, parents, the statutory right to appeal against um, the, the level of edu edu um, uh, funding that they may have without the, the money to do, to do it. Um, in, other, in other words, we're giving people the right to further uh, increase our budget deficit. Um, you're smiling. I'm smiling because <laughs> the tribunal system is in chaos <laughs> uh, um, because so many families are appealing, not against us, fortunately, but nationally, they are setting hearing dates currently for December because they do, they do not have the capacity to deal yeah. with the number of appeals that are being generated and that must be a response to local authorities trying to ration what's available 
um, and a, a gap between parents' expectations and their ambitions and what is available. Right. Well, that's a very interesting answer. Thank you. I mean, I, 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 it, all, it all comes back to this point I made earlier, which I picked up on Appendix A, that was the previous uh, item, that, you know, we've got a, now a system which promises too much and or just promises a lot, but doesn't provide the finance. I wonder whether that should be made um, you know, such letters somewhere. Which is basically, you know, it's, it's all very well saying, where is it right spot, right place, right time, no money. Well, that's right, yeah. Um, can I make a suggestion? I don't know if this is relevant, but maybe a little Jeanette said earlier, it would, might it be an idea to add a thought and respond something about uh, shoes with SEM and then transport to hospital stores? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how funding is triggered there, but they're not that high and dry. I think that's a fair but... Yeah, I mean, 5 8, we've said, you know, it should be reasonably funded. So, yeah, which, no, oh, so, 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 5 8, we're saying FE should be regionally because at the, at the moment, it's, it, you're hostage to fortune. If there's a HQ of a college in your postcodes, then you have to do it for everybody. And we said, you know, that would also work for hospital education. Yeah, the fund it Education is funded by the Department for Education, all of it, but it's within our DSG. But it's <laughs> it's separately um, built on a historic need for the number of hospitals and number of children in hospital. Yeah, we're, we're simply saying that uh, if it's serving a, a broader area than just one local authority, then it would make more sense to be funded regionally so that the, the, um, there's a, a greater strategic overview well, of the pressures. Throughout England, by taking £6.50 off to every child in England, and then it was put into a pot of £60 million, which is then just a spread out among hospital education. So it isn't, doesn't take off your money. That's how it's done by the Department for Education. Okay, so I think we, I mean, that some of that can be picked up, but I think yeah. in terms of, of the response of the, the green paper, I mean, lots of things in that, in-year transfer, yeah. in the hospital school would be Thank interesting. You. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was problematic for any school, but certainly the hospital schools are there are funding issues. Okay, should we, should we move this on? Because I think this, yeah. oh, at the end of you asked, really briefly, just to, not, there's been an, an extension yeah. to the consultation period. We really encourage people to respond. Obviously, we got kind of the feedback we're getting this evening in terms of our response. We've got our SCND Executive Partnership Board, haven't we, Jimmy, where there have been some quite in depth discussions mm -hmm. to, to draw responses. You're welcome. We, you know, uh, parents themselves putting responses in. Two things I would say, the point about outcomes in 1.2, building on Julie's point, I'm sure you've all seen the KNC send their inspection report, if not, please do have a look, because it's a, a way of actually watching all of the work that you do, schools, early years, setting colleges, work for families, it is the best inspection report in the country, under the same framework, there were no areas for development, for education, and health, but clearly what we're saying here is there is a cost to delivering that vision, however, however efficiently you do it. And the other thing I would say, really just a plea um, for, you know, that point for alternative provision. We've had long discussions at four and a half weeks, I'm sure we will again, about how that's funded and the join up. And obviously we sympathise with colleagues in AP are having to try and pull their funding together from local authorities constrained by NEFOS, by charging schools directly. So, you know, if you're able to put response in, there is something for me about how we support greater stability in alternative provision of behaviour and reach funding, particularly given the increased need for that type of provision. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, we, we also have a report to welcome to yeah. the officers as well. Um, okay, so um, I just want you to note the report um, under section six. Um, let's move on to A7, uh, high needs, EBT review, um, update very much following on from the last meeting. Um, Julie, you can you. Talk? Yeah. Uh, so high needs funding operational guidance issued by the DfE sets out where individual pupils require additional support that costs more than 6,000 the excess should be met by top-up over and above core funding. 
And top up funding doesn't contribute to or subsidise overheads attributable to other school budgets or the costs that have to be met, even if the school has no pupils with high needs, for example, the SENCO. And Schools Forum had noted the high needs overspend, largely due to the significant increase in funding for education and health care plans allocated to be the education banding tool, and Forum endorsed the need for an urgent review of affordability. So this report is giving an update following further consideration um, from the uh, extraordinary meeting in March. Um, the EBT review that we did found that 60% of funding have been allocated at band seven or above of, of the 10 bands. And 38% was actually providing funding that was equivalent to at least 7.4 hours per day of one-to-one -one teaching assistance support. So the analysis that we did in the review indicated that the system needed some very urgent recalibration. So um, officers have worked with the system developers to ensure that it's amended, and I can confirm that the recalibrated system was put in place from the start of April. Now, the review had highlighted that the EBT was providing an average of £3,500 per pupil per annum, more than the cost of the support specified in the Education, Health and Care Plan. The review found that the top-up funding that was allocated to bands 8 to 10 was exceeding the average cost of a full-time teaching assistant, and that that calculation was done based on payroll returns, looking at you know, what people were actually paid with the on costs. So following discussion at Schools Forum, banding for, uh, the funding for bands 8 to 10 has been capped at 18,636, which is the full-time cost less than 6,000. So all children should still receive the provision specified in their plans and Forum had agreed not to make any further changes until September 22. So uh, since the last meeting, local authority has agreed a temporary hardship fund for schools already in deficit or where this capping would cause a deficit, funded from the council's fund, not from the high needs block. Um, we wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that no changes have been made to the targeted safety net mechanism, which we previously agreed, that uh, ensures the most inclusive schools, the highest number of EHCPs, are still receiving a 3K refund for each plan that they're having to provide support for once they've reached the threshold. And Forum will remember that the threshold is calculated as once you're spending 50% of your notional funding just putting in place the, the first 6,000 for pupils with the HCPs. And typically, the, the threshold is achieved at kind of 6 to 10 EHCPs in a primary school. So the High East Block um, Review Group had considered whether to pause or maintain the EBT rollout, noting there were no alternative systems, and agreed that in the absence of an alternative system, we would continue with the rollout, but we would have some moderation. And the terms of reference for the moderation that's going to take place have been um, attached at Appendix 1. And you'll see that that is happening this month, and um, that there's a, a anonymised pa case papers being sent to everybody who's taking part in the review. Uh, we said we'd send them out at least five days in advance, and they have gone out now. And we've had them on Monday morning, and the meeting is on Thursday next week. So um, it, this, there is quite a lot of reading for each set of papers, but um, the, the terms of reference are there hopefully for forum to agree because we need to get the reading out to everybody in advance. Um, the, other, the other action, the further action is we, we are now reviewing all of the bands that have already been allocated. Um, so as, as they come up for annual review, we will be looking at the allocated band and we will be confirming that it is correct or we will be making a correction to it. And a major consideration for forum is what to do about any overpayments that happened if the correction, um, you know, if it was a band seven and out to band five, and that, that, that was erroneously paid too high last year. No schools have been asked to repay funding for the financial year 21-22, as this could have been a significant challenge for schools in deficit or where it would cause a deficit. And I, and I want to emphasise there, because even today I had a, a telephone um, 
call from a head teacher who thought that they were going to get funding clawed back last year, but we haven't asked anybody to pay back funding for last year. What we have said is where the review identifies that the ban, the ban does require correction, that the effective start date for kind of calculating what the difference is will be the 1st of September 22, so that everybody has this term has kind of noticed that, you know, in September it's likely that, that you might be asked to, um, you know, that there will be a correction, you might be asked to have a call back. That's for for forum to discuss in the autumn. The review did find that there were some inconsistencies from multiple system users and one of the things that we want to look at is whether or not having a dedicated EBT officer means that the application of the tool and the output are you know, robustly consistent with you sort of doing a bit of testing of that behind scenes. Could I just ask, have we not got an anomaly now with bound seven? Because if the pattern bounds eight, yeah, bound seven is more. So you haven't really not going to try and do bound seven. So right. it, it, isn't, it isn't more because what you're seeing here is with the 6,000 still in. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. Sorry. So there's nothing. Julie, thank you so much. You've worked so hard and you've actually made such a difference to special needs in the borough. However, if it starts from September, we've all set our budgets in March for the whole year. And so um, you will get all the money you expected. And if that's cut, all those children are cut, that's, that's you know, at least a teacher or two teachers, how that's going to be managed. And also, you can recalibrate the figures, but you can't recalibrate the child. Because you can't. I think so the how can I put now? We'll discuss this at the next forum meeting. We're going to discuss how. But, but it happens now. We've decided this for the last four weeks. So we, we decided this in March. Lots of us were still setting these set budgets through March, April. The submission of the budgets. So I think this, we, we have had time to look at this and start to, to plan uh, as schools is being communicated. So uh, this is more, this paper is not a decision paper. This is, this is something for us to know based mm -hmm. an update based on the decision that was made, discussed in a lot of detail in, in, on the 23rd of March, and then returned to again in, 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 an extraordinary meeting at the end of March where we voted. This is going back and looking at what's been done since then uh, and what potential impact is going forward. And I think Julie, I think you've navigated this really, really well given how difficult the decision this was and going to the council and getting additional partnership funds to support schools where this is going to be a difficult situation for particular schools and funding changes. It's something that we're definitely going to be coming back to and I think this is in the is in, in, in action too that we're going to be looking again at the, the repayment model. Um, if I'm calling that correct. Yes, and at that point we'll have the output from the moderation exercise to be able to share with Lauren. Okay. Can I just ask something? I mean, I think it's a really difficult situation and there's going to be an impact. So I, and I think we can discuss it. Um, you just mentioned something which I haven't come on to. Is it going to have to point a thing you post or allocate somebody to actually manage this moderation? The, the tool's already been used. Yes, I know, but I think it makes sense. It's, it's, been, it's been used by lots of different officers. Yeah, and when we did the review, we, we could see that there were some inconsistencies. And so, you know, we strengthened the user manual. But what we're just testing is that we've we've released a member of staff to be the person mm -hmm. who is doing uh, the, the work for us on the moderation. So we can see if there is a difference when you just have... You know, a dedicated officer for it. Right. So you know, we 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 don't know if it's just about consistency. Yeah, I don't think, I think, I think it's good. Yeah. Well, I I don't mind. Do 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 all borrowers use this this particular tool? No. <laughs> okay, no. but I think that actually makes my point. That's okay. Um, you know, at some point, does the the effort and funding that is required to make this tool work? Um, well, interestingly, it's in the DfE's proposals. 
Yeah. So in their green paper, saying how they're going to tackle the yeah. um, enormous investment in the system, <laughs> um, unprecedented <laughs> investment, <laughs> yeah. um, they are saying that they are going to move to banding and tariffs. So national banding and tariffs. So in our response, we'll be saying it's jolly hard. You know, we've been trying to to get a system that is transparent is yeah. equitable which we th we thought we'd done and the third the third thing we've tried to achieve was something that was affordable yeah. and that's where we we kind of started to say actually we've got to recalibrate our model to make it affordable thank you that's a question and help me to understand it and only i find it very confident can i, can I ask just Please. ask the ubt moderator presumably this is a redeployment rather than a new post just within within our team, we within just team, as, right. as a leader of the team, I kind of looked away. Who's going to be? Who's got? Who's got the best skill set to be able to right. drag them away from their day job and get them to do this? And and who might cover some of their work? So we we kind of looked at who who had the strongest kind of skills for that. Yeah, no, no, cabinet no, no, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Should we, should we move on from this one? Because we could get into a rabbit hole again. Um, so, uh, just if we could read the uh, Ask Mr. Samantha Report and endorse the recommendations for section 5. Um, okay, right, let's move on to A8, uh, NFS consultation. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm sure you're probably, you're probably all aware that the, the DFP will publish their response to their, um, to their um, consultation on the school's national funding formula. And you know, as expected, it confirms the ambition that all mainstream schools funding will be via a hard national funding formula rather than through our, our current local formula arrangements. Uh, there's no deadline for the complete move to the NFF. And and for 23-24, there will, you know, we will be having a, a local funding formula, although we are required to move at least 10% closer. Um, in terms of the, so since Can I just clarify that? that? That is a DfE requirement there. That's but a DfE every requirement. local authority. Yes, every, every local authority yes. has to be in the extent. I have actually, um, since the paper's written, I have um, seen something um, uh, in a published uh, in, in a publication that was saying that um, the earliest, well, the intention is that it's not for another potentially for another five years before NFA comes in. But who knows? You know, this has been going on, this has been going on for a long time. So that does seem to tie in with what, what this says. Um, so there so it's certainly a gradual approach. Uh, to something 10 years since it was announced. That's how long it is. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Continuing, <laughs> continuing the gradual approach um, and this requirement of moving every factor at least 10% closer. And then, the, the, so at the moment, they're going to wait to see what happens after that 10% move before they decide on any movements in future years. There will be movement, but what level it will be, we don't know. Um, there, will, there will be further consultation on the, on, on the hard NFF. Uh, so, so they haven't decided what they're going to do about falling roles funding, about some of the premises funding, so that split site will affect some, some of our schools, um, and how much flexibility there is on some of these factors for from next year. So we're, we're waiting for that further consultation. And so, yes, we set, we set our own formula for next year we, under these parameters. And there will, um, there will be... Uh, we're expecting that there will be a continuation of the minimum funding guarantee. So, so for 22-23, that was that schools had to receive between half a percent and 2% increase in per pupil funding. Again, that publication, the, the article that I saw, is something about the MFG might move more in line with the funding floor and the national funding formula, but I have no further details on that, so we'll watch this space and see what they may be more prescriptive maybe they'll say it's got to be i don't know a one percent increase or something but i don't know we've still got that we've still got a, a range at the moment yeah. uh so um it, looking at section three 
Look at section three, three which we just said it's it only saying five percent. Yeah. Maybe that's why they're being more direct. Yes. <laughs> Section three has got the principles that have previously, three point one, that have previously been agreed by the forum, and there's just a proposal to change one of those to say that we, you know, we have now that we know there is a, you know, a required move towards the hard NFF, that we reflect that in the principles. Um, and then section four, and I, I really apologise, um, my mistake and it is a different paper to the in paragraph 4.1 it says with wcc clearly that should be rbk <laughs> and i can assure you it is a different this is a different paper to um the Westminster paper um because my head doesn't you know gets it wrong so i apologize for that um so we know we've got to move at least 10 percent and um so this paper is not asking for any decision on what option we do use. It's asking for agreement on what options we consult the head teacher groups with in the autumn term. And that's um, so option one is moving the minimum, the 10 percent closer. Option two is moving 15 percent. And option three was if we move to the full NFF factors, um, the problem with that one, that it would have the minimum funding guarantee at more than 2%, so we'd have to get agreement of the DfE if we went for that one. So that was not recommended for further consultation. Uh, we have, you know, modelled all those options, so you, you, you know, you can see, but as I say, it's not, we're not asking you for a decision yet. Um, that, they're really the main points I wanted to pull out. So. Yeah, that's a I think uh, the interesting that they, they, it's a requirement. Um, and obviously that, that's a clear direction of travel. And also, um, I think this is all, just to remind uh, colleagues on the phone, this is all part of the, our remodel way of working in terms of being transparent about school funding and the processes of decision making. So we don't make decisions at the 11th hour, but there's good time uh, and lots of thought that goes into what we will consider in the autumn term. Are there any any views on the, what we've got here on the 10, 15 and NFF? Or we have to just have three, three options to consider. The one that we've just, there's just two in that case. Is it option three, you'll say? The Pat's asked permission. Yeah, it doesn't mean we can't consult it. If the forum would like to consult on three options, then... Um, so it's also choose whether we want to include... Do you want to include that third option in consultation or whether... Well, that's only procedures, we don't know if it's an option. Yeah, we'd have to get approved. Yeah. But we should see what the NFF is, though. We'd have to have that on the piece of paper anyway. Like, if you want to see what the impact is long term against the national funding. There's you know, benefits actually, I'm thinking about some inventions. Just, you know, I don't know. Um, I think I think we could we could, we could end up having a conversation in the autumn here. Yes. I think. Oh, no, I think the, the, so because what we're deciding is whether we're going to. I think no. Three my, options my, or two. My, my point is is that on on whatever we put on the to paper here, we're, we're just going to end up in a situation with some sort of a win, some sort of a lose well, across all the different options. So what we've got here is two clear options and the potential to discuss. The national funding formula and whether or not the problem we would like to go to a consultation on that. And I think we're down so many forum members. I think just I would recommend we leave this as it is for our autumn term. Well, that, that would be time, then, wouldn't it? We'd probably get to the seats in February. Or they're yeah. generally in the 20th. Gen January. Yeah. Yeah. So we will, yeah. con we will consult at the beginning of the autumn term mm -hmm. with their head teacher groups. And then we will come back to the November forum, and that's when ideally the decision will be taken. But yeah. And, what, and when is our forum? It's November the. Actually, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay. We did that. I, I'm still a bit worried about option three. Sorry, so if we put option three to the school, then they come back to the forum. Then it comes to the forum in November. Then we have to ask for permission, and we? Yeah. The 
DfE will, their DfE have a process where they have to give fairly quick response. They have, they would have to give us response before January. Okay. And you're happy that? Yes, if I'm happy the if it's on the Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think timing is okay. Ask a question, which would be the answer. Not just concerned that there's these different times. If people want to pursue options, they actually don't do it. So, why don't we ask Alice to go away and look at this and see what times you have to take on? I think she's happy with this. I think we're now happy. Yeah, yeah I'm happy to have the NFF back to values on this piece of paper, which we need to know where we are. So. So if it's, yeah, if the timeline is the same as it was for last yeah. year, we have to let the DFE know um, in November that we want, in fact, we can pre-warn them that we, we may have, we may be asking for permission um, and then confirm in November of the forum and then would know by January so that if there was, we, we can't go for that option, then we'll take over that decision. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. Peter? One further question. If you look at the uh, models for 23-24, um, if you move 15% close to the NFN, it throws up three schools where there's substantial changes in funding for pupil negatively. They are Marlborough, Mary Abbott's, and uh, St. Cuthbert with Matthias. So it will be to do with the um, the mix uh, and, and uh, in terms of deprivation, the level of deprivation, the level of um, low prior attainment, and uh, you know, and oh, right. pupil numbers. So it's the, it's all the factors right. changing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so that's the Mr. Smith report on endorsement recommendations in section seven. Um, and then finally, A9 and the business. Okay, great. Um, that concludes the meeting of the hall. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>